I do not know how, if you are a parent, you were parenting without the Lord. I mean, there were conversations where I was like, you know what, you're the father. You're gonna have to step in and either provide what we need here or provide someone to speak over him what you need to speak over him. Coming live from Charlotte, North Carolina, we are here with the swim champion, Justice Springer. I have a question. This is the wildest journey I've ever been on. And I'm realizing, oh my gosh, this is partnership. Like this adoption is, is a partnership with the Lord. Hey everybody, this is Rita Springer. Welcome to the Rita Springer podcast and worship is my weapon. I am in a continuation of part two of my adoption story. Um, this is kind of my favorite story to tell in my whole life. Adoption just um, took me down a road with the Lord that I've never been on. And, you know, I love this verse in Ephesians where it says, the love of God is so high, so wide, so deep, so long, that it surpasses um, our intellect or surpasses the knowledge of man, it says in some translations. And I remember I was sitting on a plane. I was reading that verse one day, you know, the love of God, just thinking about how precious the love of God is. And, um, you know, that it, it has a height to it. It has a width to it. It has a depth to it. And, you know, when you're, when you're uh, madly in love with the Lord, and I know we go through seasons like that where we feel it a little bit stronger, but, you know, I really remember a beautiful season in my life when I started to just get to know the presence of God and fall in love with the presence of God that I would go to bed at night and I would just be like, talk to the Lord. I would talk to the Lord until I slept, until I fell asleep. And man, I look back on that and I'm like, oh, he must've just thought it was the best because, you know, sometimes we don't always do that anymore. We were so distracted by so many things, but those were just those beautiful moments of that introduction to the depths of God. It's like, you didn't know you could find God like that. And you didn't know. And then God shows up like this and oh my gosh, he answers a prayer like this. And I think God gives us those really beautiful seasons because obviously there's going to be harder seasons uh, on the road when you keep um, trekking with the Lord. But I think that our progressive state with the Lord takes us to a deeper position and a deeper position and a deeper position. And so even being on this plane one day, flying high, reading the scripture, I was like, surpasses the knowledge of men. You know, does that just give us a like a loophole out, God? Like, you're so good that, you know, if we tried to figure you out, we'd never figure your love out. And I just felt like the Lord said, yeah, it, 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 your human intellect can't identify or, or almost like, it's almost like, um, putting something under the microscope as a scientist in a sense, and trying to figure out the breakdown of that molecule or the breakdown of that cell or whatever. And it's just, it's too lofty and, and there's just no explanation for it. You could try, but you can't, but it creates this thing that you want to do more research to try to get to the bottom of this. And so along the way in the research of God's love, what you're actually encountering is you're encountering a greater width to it, a greater depth to it, a greater height to it. And I've always loved that scripture because to me, it's like, if you want the, if you want the expression of God's love or the depth of God's love or a, a, a different exposure of God's love in your life, our life in the circumstantial evidence of what happens to us is an opportunity for God to constantly reveal himself to us. And so um, I, I, I love it. I, I, I entered into this kind of adoption process and this thing hit where I felt like, oh my gosh, I haven't identified the cell, but something's happened with the cell and it's exploded. And I'm like, this is kind of fascinating to me that this is a different side of, of God's nature. And I was hearing God say things that I would have never heard the Lord say if I hadn't been on this journey with the Lord, if I hadn't said, okay, all right, I'll do this. Even though, keep keep in mind, I'm in the back of my mind, I'm like, it's Isaac, you know, I'll just walk it, walk it up the mountain and be like, because there is this process with the Lord where you don't know what God's going to allow, right? So if you have a track record um, or you have, you know, there's some credible evidence, let me say credible evidence that uh, you may be called to something that never happens. You may be called to something that takes a long route. You may be called to something that doesn't look like it was supposed to look or what you thought it was supposed to look like. And when you've got the credibility of that stuff happening in the past, 
sometimes when God asks you to do things, you're like, uh, 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 okay, God, but, oh, is this going to turn out like that? Is this going to be like this? Are you going to do that? Are you going to, and man, when you're, when you're doing something like adoption and, and there's somebody housing the baby, there's a, there's a woman housing a baby. That's the birth track, the DNA line in that baby. It's hard to connect with the baby emotionally you're doing that. But I was so aware of this. I was so aware of like, girl, don't get in there and be like, jump in that pool full on and then just be like drenched. And then all of a sudden be like, Oh, sorry, not this one, maybe the next one. And then all of a sudden your emotions are ragged. And, and I'm, I'm seeing myself literally, I'm having flashbacks of being in a fetal position, a fetal position. I'm not, that's not, um, drama. When, when I handed that baby back on the plane, um, to its biological grandmother after that se six weeks, seven weeks that I had that baby, I was in a fetal position. I couldn't eat. I couldn't sleep. I was just, and so the, I I'm thinking, okay, he wants me to, okay, this is Isaac. I'm going to take it up the mountain. He wants me to go through these. I'm learning all these things. Every time you were investing in it, every time you get, you get the home study, she comes and she assesses your house and you're cleared off and the checkpoint and checkpoint and you're getting closer and you're getting closer and you're getting closer. And then the agency that I was attached to, just the sweetest lady, really amazing woman of God and walked me through everything. She finds out that I'm single. And so we're having this conversation one day and she's like, Rita, you're single. Like there's a policy in, in, you know, this company that I, I just, I can't, adopt to single people. And then she tells a story of how she finds out I'm single. She knew I was, she knew who I was because of my artistry, because of the, the music. And I think she just automatically assumed I was married. And so she finds out I'm single and she's like, she has this encounter with the Lord, with the Lord's like, I'm doing this. You have to make a way for her. And she, she calls me up and she's like, if I had not had an encounter with the Lord, like I, I couldn't do this for you. And so she's like, so there are, there are limitations in this now that I know that you're single that I just have to do because there's just this policy and there are legalities in this that, and for whatever reason, a lot of Christian, you know, adoption agencies, they're just like, I don't know why there's some really great single people out there that love Jesus, but you know, the world and the church they have their own idea of what singleness looks like. And so, but I was just so grateful that, that God spoke to her, but again, okay. So if you're, if you're taking steps and it's Isaac, right? I'm just going to, this isn't going to probably work. God's really not calling me to this. Like just walk it out, just walk it out. The Lord's going to be, he's going to be like, thank you Rita for being so obedient. Oh my God, you're amazing. Like I, I what would I do without you? but you don't have to walk that out. You're going to get married and it's going to look like you want it to look like that. So in the back of my head, I'm like, this is the scenario we're like, we're like vying for, but let's, let's all of a sudden, let's keep it in this place where every time something's done, this thing hit my heart and I was going into levels of beauty with the Lord where I was like, I, I kind of, I don't want to really admit it, but I kind of really want this to work. And then you would get to the next level. I, oh, okay, if this didn't really work, this would really be hard. And so I'm realizing that it really doesn't matter if it works or it doesn't work. There's an investment stake that my heart has in this. And if the Lord pulls this off and says, you, I was just looking for your obedience, and this is Isaac, and you have to lay your Isaac down, I, I'm going to be sad. And so, okay, now I'm, I'm, I'm self-protecting, but I'm actually, I'm, I'm being drawn into this thing. And I think that was part of the holy experience. I don't know how to explain that in a way that, that is maybe eloquent enough or, or that you could just attach it. All I'm saying is the process of walking something out with the Lord can be the most beautiful process that you have, whether it's an adoption story like mine whether it's a single story, whether it's a job story, whether it's a God's called you to a, a, the mission field story and, and you're getting it there. The journey of walking that out with the Lord, whether it's a 
I'm just going to, I'm going to say it to you, whether it's a, a, a diagnosis, a health diagnosis where somebody's telling you or a doctor's telling you, you know, you, you, this has been found in your body and, and this is what it's going to look like. Whatever the journey is, whatever this thing that we're given called circumstance or the evidence of something that's costly that God's initiating in our lives and saying, no, you're going to move out of state. You're going to leave your job. You're going to do this. Um, it's a process to walk out with the Lord. And it's, it's an, an Ephesians encounter of the love of God where the progress of it is going to, at the end of it, the end result is always going to be, if you do it with the Lord, the end result is you're going to see God in a way you've never seen the Lord before. And so when I'm entering this thing with the Lord and it's this adoptive thing, okay, it's a characteristic of God. So adoption is a characteristic of God's heart. And I'm, I'm reading those places in scripture and I'm, I'm starting to collect these books. Like I want to be like the great adoptive mom, right? And I'm reading these things. And I remember being on a boat um, in a, a job that I held while I lived in Seattle. And I, I was on a, on a boat with my boss. My boss was very wealthy. She had this boat we would take out and these friends of hers came and we were sitting on, on this boat and these, this couple friends of my bosses, I, I was serving them and I'm talking to them and getting them lunch. And, and she has an adopt adoptive child. And I'm, I'm thinking back on this story way before this encounter with the Lord to, to go on this adoption track, finding justice. And she's telling the story of her son. And I remembered the story so clearly. And the Lord brought this story back to me in the process of this thing. And she, she says, you know, in our court system, um, and it's not just in um, our nation, but it's across the, the globe. She's like, you can take your biological child in and have the right severed legally that you ever were their parent. And she said, it's very kind of a weird thing to think about, but if my biological child, I didn't want anymore, I could go into a court system and I could sever the right to be their parent. She said, but in the legal system of our government and our judiciary system, um, you, when you adopt a baby by law, you don't have the right to sever your connection with them. So the law of adoption is actually more clad than the law of biology. And when she said that, I remember it just struck me as just because, you know, these, this couple were, were Christians and she said, isn't that quite beautiful that God's law of adoption, which derives back, I think, to Hebrew law, when he says, I've adopted you as sons, I've adopted you as my children, what God is actually saying in scripture is, I cannot sever my rights to be your father. And that flew all over me at such a young age in my 20s, that when I'm walking through this process with, with justice, the Lord is bringing that back and he's saying, remember, you, you're entering into the covenant with this baby the way I entered into a covenant with you. When, you're, when, when, when you came to know me, I became your father. When your father died at nine, I became your father. And when your mother died at 21, I became a father and a mother to you. And I can't sever my right to be that for you. When you take on this baby, you literally become and you look like me more and more and more. And that just, man, that was heavy for me. Like I, I, I love that illustration it, it put power in me. And again, it advanced me to a point where I was like, all of a sudden, another love, you know, door of the Lord flies open. And I'm like, oh my gosh, the heart of the Lord. Like it's it, like, it's supernaturally like taking me by storm. And I'm just like, this, this is serious. Like God is all over this. Like everything I needed, like it, it, it at that point, it was a $15,000, you know, adventure to go on. And I was seeing people just give me money out of the blue. I mean, we were doing these conferences and, and anything that was needed, you know, the 15,000 for legal stuff wasn't what the home study was. That was all extra. And then you're, you're 
you're literally making your entire house fit for this child to come and live. And, and everything I, I asked the Lord for, okay, I've never, you have to understand, I've never seen the Lord do this so fast. So I needed this. It was there. I needed this. It was there. And, and I was so aware of the fact that when something is the Lord's and he's asked you to do it, every door is open to you to do it. And when it's, it's something that you're, that's going to cost you something and it, and you're not being like, Oh, I'm hesitant about it. And okay. A couple years later, God has to talk to you about it again. And oh, 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 those kind of things. This was something I just was like, okay, I'll do it. Even though in the back of my mind, I've still got the Isaac on the altar thing. I'm watching God open doors and I'm finding life as I'm watching God open these doors. And man, I want that even right now for those that are, um, you know, in the process of wanting to adopt or, or however, if you, if you're, if you're a couple and you haven't been able to conceive and you're thinking about, you know, adopting and you're just like, yeah, but it's so expensive because it's so expensive now. And, um, I just want, I want you to know if the Lord has put it on your heart to do it, you don't hesitate and don't labor in any moment where you're like, how are we going to get the money for this? Money is not a problem for God if he's got something in store for you. Like, it's just not a problem. You know, if, if money, like money's always been a problem for me because I have a problem with the spirit of poverty. And I'm so afraid that there's never going to be enough because of trauma from growing up in such severe poverty. That's a problem because I make it a problem. But when God's asking something of us and we're saying yes to God, why would the Lord be like, oh, good, you said yes. Now the obstacles are going to be so horrifying. You know, if there's obstacles along the way, it's usually doors that press something into us, that push us into something where when we get past that door, we're like, oh my gosh, okay, now I see it. Now I see it. I just want you guys to know that like the process of God, there is a difference when God calls you to something and your yes is yes, as opposed to God calling you something and you're hesitant about it because you just don't know what it's going to cost you. There, there are, are, um, the doors that open don't have squeaks to them. And I was experiencing this and that was making me hyperventilate a little bit more realizing, Oh God, this is real. This is real. This is real. Now what I did, what I did feel is, and the agency that I was with was like, um, you need to be okay with the girl. Um, I'm, we're not going to give you a boy. We're going to give you a girl. And I was like, you know what? I think they called it fallout, the, a fallout parent or a fallout baby, where I was like, I don't want to walk a woman through her pregnancy. I don't want that journey. I don't feel called to that journey. Journey. I actually want an orphan. Like I want somebody that just needs a mom, that, that it's a, a quick thing that maybe somebody comes in and um, they walked into an emergency room having a baby or whatever. And she's like, well, what we call that is, those are kind of like, I think she called them fallout babies, where if there's a couple waiting for um, a baby and the baby's born and the birth mother they've been walking um, through that um, process wants to, or decides to keep the baby, um, then they get the, like the baby that's just left. They get the next baby that's the quick baby. She said, I'll just put you on the list for that. I said, put me on the list for that. That keeps me incognito as the, the single person that you, you know, don't really want to spread the news that I'm, you know, doing this as a single person. And she's like, that's great. That's what I'd put you under. And she goes, and it would have to be a girl. And so I'm like, oh, thank God. Like, there's no way I could raise a boy. And so I'm like, yeah, girl, that's perfect. That's perfect. And I'm like, it would really be great if the baby didn't have my skin tone. I mean, I just, I, I just always felt every time I'd gone to Africa, I just was like, these are my people. Like these are this, I just felt such a strong connection to, to the African nations. And, and I, I couldn't, I had no rhyme or reason for that. I just was like, I don't know what it is. Every time I feel in Africa, I feel like I'm home. Like, I feel like there's something that ties me to this land. Well, I didn't know what my story would end up being. And so when all of that stuff starts clicking later on and you're like, Oh God. So I said, 
to her, um, I want a black baby. Because I feel like I I I th- I feel like that's what I'm called to raise. And she's like, but I said, I'll take anything. Hispanic, Asian, you know, white, whatever. You know, I'm just like, I just, let's just pray that it's not white. No offense to white babies. But I just, um, you know, I there was just something about, I just, I, my, my whole being, every time I, I saw um, an ethnic child, I just felt everything just rush toward that child. And, um, and so of course, you know, I was going to get married and have, have probably have white babies later, you know? So, um, we go through this process and she's like, yeah, it has to be, it has to be a girl. So I'm having a couple showers, you know, I, 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 I have people in communities, some places that I, I go. So I think there were three or four showers, different showers that I had. And I mean, closets lined with pink and purple. And in the back of my mind, I just kept the nursery neutral. Um, you know, I, I had this really cute vintage cowgirl cowboy nursery. It was absolutely so adorable. And I set everything up. So I did everything in investment for it. And I remember I told um, the agency, hey, I just want to let you in on something about me. Okay. And so this is part of my sarcasm coming out, but this is also part of that, like, um, let me give myself a soft cushion to land on so that I've at least said it and it's out there. And then I know, well, you know, you prepared yourself for saying that and you even told her that. And that was, I just said, look, I don't know what it is about me, but God has waited to give me anything, anything that I've ever truly ever asked for in a husband, in a career, in this and this, God's just never done for me. And I don't have any rhyme or reason for that. I just, um, that's just my life. So, uh, you know, we're in this process now. God's asked me to walk through this process, but I just don't think it's going to be easy because I'm included in this. And um, if I'm here, it means it's probably going to be a long process. So I'm just telling you that um, a baby probably will not come fast. And uh, don't be looking at like, placing a baby with me for a long time. And if you're scratching your head, you can't figure out, I just don't know what's, it's because of this. It's because of the Lord, because he just makes me wait for everything. And I felt like I needed to say that because I needed to actually cushion um, the fact that what if God chose to do that again? And I needed to just have a soft place to land when it became painful. And she's like, okay. You know, she was just like, all right. And I, fill out all the paperwork, everything's in. Okay, April of 2004, September, kind of the roundabout, the end of September 2004, I am completed all the paperwork, everything's in. We're getting a fallout baby. Whenever that fallout baby comes, I'm in the process now of waiting. And I said to her, God's made me wait for everything. And and maybe a week or two weeks um, after everything was completed, I'm on a plane. I land in, um, I think somewhere in Indiana, if I'm not mistaken for a conference. And, and I turn on my flip phone back in the flip phone days. I turn on my flip phone and the thing lights up and there's a message and it's from the agency. And she's like, your birth mother just walked in. She's chosen your profile. Congratulations. Call me. And I'm sitting on the plane and I'm like, Oh my God. Oh my God. Oh my God. Oh my gosh. Oh my gosh. Oh my gosh. Oh my gosh. And, you know, I've got the team with me. We're doing this with this women's conference. And I'm just like, oh my gosh, the agency just called, the agency just called. And I'm like a nervous wreck. And I don't know what that means. And, and so, and I, and I told, I told the agency as well, when I was like, God made me wait for everything. And I'm like, and I really want an African baby. And that was the thing when the Lord told me to adopt, I was like, can we adopt in Africa? And he was like, no, you're going to go domestic. And I was like, oh, and that's why I said to the agency, I'm like, can I, we just get a black baby? because I, I really feel like I'm supposed to adopt from Africa. And so I, I call her and I'm a nervous wreck. I remember being just so nervous and she's like, well, hello. She said this morning we had a um, 23 year old woman come in. She's here on a school visa um, from Africa, from a place in Africa. Uh, And um, she is going to deliver in about, I think she was like, five or six weeks from delivery and, um, or a couple months from delivery. And she's like, she, I, I laid out profiles 
And when she walked through the door, I felt like the Lord said that you're, you were the baby's mother. And so she, I laid out profile, you're being one of them. And she chose your profile. And I'm like, what? And she goes, yeah, she's actually from Africa. It's funny that you said you wanted an African baby. It looks like God brought Africa to you. And she said, the birth father is African as well. Um, he's been deported and gone back and it's a school visa issue. And uh, she doesn't want to, you know, uh, send the baby back or have the baby back in Africa because her nation's under a lot of war right now and all these things uh, in the government. And um, she had a, a, a two-year-old uh, already and she just financially couldn't take on another baby. And she's like, we did an ultrasound and it's, it's a girl. And so um, if you want to follow through, you know, this baby's due um, November 18th. Well, the, the crazy part of my story is I had found, at that point had insurance and found an incredible um, OB, a doctor in Charlotte. And I just had a meeting with her where she had taken all the tests. And she's like, at that point, you know, my uterus was in the, in, in the swelling of a 16-week um, pregnancy just because of the fibroid tumors. And she was like, Rita, you're, you're approved to have this uh, surgery. It's called a myelomectomy where we cut you from hip to hip and we'll remove those tumors and we'll clean everything out. And I think I could save your uterus. And so I had just had this meeting with her where we had all the tests come in and she's like, let's do this. Let's put a date on the calendar. Well, the date on the calendar was November 18th. And I'm on the phone with the agency and she's like, the baby's due November 18th. And I just heard from the doctor and she's like, Rita, the, basically the surgeries, they cut you from hip to hip and you're, gonna, you're going to respond in, in this surgery kind of in the manner of a, of a woman that's just had a C-section. And yes, in the back of my mind, there was a flash of, that's, that's just weird. Like, that's so weird. Like, is, is this God's way of letting me feel like I'm having a baby and my body's going to feel like it just had a baby when I didn't have a baby. But so I'm like, Oh, that's too weird. That's too weird. That's too weird. That's that would just be too weird. Too weird of the Lord. So I, um, I just kind of pushed that in the back of my mind. I'm like, Oh my gosh. Oh gosh. Like when can I meet her? Like, can we talk? And we kind of started an, an initiation of like, just, you know, conversation and things like that. And, um, I think I talked to her on the phone a couple of times. And then after Thanksgiving in um, November of uh, 2004, I drove from Charlotte to where he was born in Jacksonville, Florida, and waited basically for him to be born. And it was after Thanksgiving. So, you know, um, she'd kind of passed that due date of the 18th. And so I was just waiting and waiting and we rescheduled my surgery for January, 2005, early January, 2005. So basically I'm just in a waiting game for this baby that the, the room is prepared. I'm a nervous wreck. I don't know what she's going to do after, you know, she has the baby and I have, it's, you know, it's the holiday season, right? So I have this name picked out and I felt like I, I needed to name this baby Liberty. Because I felt like the Lord was like, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give birth to your freedom in the birth of this baby. And, um, you know, my, uh, our birth mother's name was Patience, which was interesting because here I told the agency, you know, God's make me wait for everything. He's made me wait for everything. And, and the, the, the woman that would give birth to my child, her name was actually Patience. And so... I just was like, how weird is this? This is just getting almost too weird with the Lord's like, there's all these little things. And it was interesting when I met her, um, uh, you know, after Thanksgiving and she walks into this restaurant, um, you know, I, I have things kind of monogrammed at that point. I even had a stocking monogrammed for Christmas for Liberty. Um, her, her name was going to be um, uh, Liberty Selah. Um, and I just thought, man, that's going to be the best name, uh, um, for this baby. And, um, I met this woman and I'm coming in and I, to get to this restaurant, you have to take 
um, you know, this turn onto Liberty Drive and I'm sitting in this restaurant and I'm, I'm looking over Liberty Drive and there's the Liberty Bank across the street and everything's Liberty, 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 Liberty. And I'm like, oh my gosh, this is just the most prophetic thing in the world. And she walks in and she's just this stunning, stunning African woman. And she's got this beautiful little two-year-old daughter on her hip. And, and, and now we're in this and we're in this in a place where this is the surreal, um, this is a very surreal thing. And I, I, I want to actually almost pause in, in the, in the telling of this here and really identify the, the, the heroic, uh, the heroic nature of a birth mom. And, um, I, I, I don't know for me, birth moms are not lost in the translation, but I think that sometimes, you know, we're, we're so focused on how we get the baby and, you know, we went through this adoption process and, and how beautiful. And I just, I was so incredibly aware of, um, the strength and the, uh, Oof, what it would what it would take for a woman um, to carry a child for that long and know that they were making a decision where they would never be able to raise or see that baby um, sometimes for the rest of their lives. And that just wasn't lost on me. There was something about that that and I, I felt like the Lord was like, you know, she's the she's the heroine of your story. She's always going to be the heroine of your story. And I um, was just really kind of blown away by that. And so I was so tender with her because I, obviously it's like the, the, the baby that you're supposed to raise is in her belly. And I don't know if she's actually, if that's going to actually be Isaac where I don't really get the baby. And so there's this kind of awkward dance that you're kind of doing with this beautiful human being that has made this decision that's this absolutely soul-crushing decision, probably the most soul-crushing thing that they'll ever make in their entire life. And you, my, I felt like the command of the Lord was that that had to be on the forefront of my mind at all times, that her heart and her emotions had to be on the forefront of my mind. And and so, you know, it's, it's awkward talk. It's, you don't really know what to say. You're trying to think of all these things. And, um, and she's so kind and she's so precious. And we, you know, we ended that conversation and I just, I took her to the doctor, I think the next day or maybe that afternoon, I can't remember. And I'm in the city and we're just basically, I'm just like in a hotel room by myself, no family around me by myself, which was actually really kind of hard but it was, it was holy because the Lord was there and I'm, I'm a mess, you know, and so I'm distracting myself by going down and shopping, you know, finding these little beautiful little stores and shopping for things and bringing all these little beautiful girl things back to the, the, to the hotel. And when you adopt in the state of Florida, um, the birth mother has 24 hours, uh, to decide. So the rights are cut within 24 hours in different States. Sometimes it's, um, a few days, sometimes it's 60 days, sometimes it's 30 days. But um, uh, the law in, in uh, the state of Florida, which is where my adoption was legalized, um, it, you have 24 hours. So it, there's not a, a waiting period. You basically have 24 very hard hours before you know whether or not it's, it's a go. And so I am just trying to keep my head on straight. You're just an abs I'm ab absolute nervous wreck trying to do this thing with the Lord. Now I'm invested. I'm fully in. I'm experiencing this beautiful um, process with God and, and progressing into these beautiful corners of, of God's precious heart and me merging in line with, with his heart. And I, I was reading all these books. And in all these books that I was reading and prep to adopt and become an adoptive parent, Every book had this psychology attached to it about the broken identity, the broken identity, be careful about the broken identity. And, and, and I, I was just tripped up by that. And I was like, Lord, why would you call adoption this beautiful thing when, when in all these stories that I'm reading, there's these broken identity and, you know, the kid became teenager and blah, blah, blah. 
And a lot of those cases, I think, were adoptions that happened later on, not so much adoptions from birth. I think there's a difference when you get a baby from birth and the baby's with you and is is bonding with you from birth. But I'm still quite grieved about about the process of of identity and 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 the strain on the identity. I understand it. I understand the psychosis of it. I understand the the psychology of all of how that happens. And yes, those things are there. I the identity process of it. But I kept turning back toward the Lord and I kept saying, I'm not wanting to just be in this to raise a child who then has a broken identity. I'm like, how do I do this and do this well to where my child isn't suffering from a broken identity? And and Holy Spirit said to me, he just, I was so precious. He just leaned out and he's like, aha, great question. I'll parent with you. If you partner with me in parenting this baby, then I am the one that will help seal and help navigate in the hard times where you will find it easier to bring back to the center, back to the center of where the identity actually is. And I am telling you, A, I do not know how, if you are a parent, you are parenting without the Lord. I don't, I would never do it. I would never venture out to do it. I would never encourage somebody to, to parent without Christ. But I'm not talking about, you know, just praying and praying over our kids and having a, you know, I'm talking about parenting with the Lord. Like, well, you're his father. So I, I you're going to have to step in. I mean, there were conversations where I was like, you know what? You're the father. You're going to have to step in and either provide what we need here or provide someone to speak over him what you need to speak over him. And so I didn't really know you could have that access with the Lord. Like I'm, again, Ephesians, I'm reaching for in need, reaching for a portion of God's connection, the love of God that I need for this. And when I'm reaching out for it, I'm this door's flinging open and the, the depths of God and the height and the breadth and the width of God, I'm gaining, I'm progressing in this thing. And I'm like, this is the wildest journey I've ever been on. But God is showing up in the midst of it. And then he's breathing like this revelation in the midst of it that's kind of blowing my mind. And I'm realizing, oh my gosh, this is partnership. Like this adoption is, is a partnership with the Lord. And it's, it's surreal. And it's crazy. And... I am now fully invested. And if this doesn't go right, I can feel the fetal position. Like I'm like, oh God, please, 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 please. And I and I and I feel like that just that precious, that wasn't anything. God um knew from the beginning, or God was like, This is how you're gonna be, this is how you're gonna respond. I responded that way to protect my own heart. And all God did was provide every open door to prove himself right in the whole process of it. But I was the one that was like, oh, no, 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 no. Like you've, I've been hurt by this before. I got to protect myself here. I got to protect myself here. I got to call it an Isaac. I got to do this. I got to, I got to call you what sometimes you look like. And I got to protect myself and I got to, you know, put, you know, some knee pads on, some elbow pads on. Cause if I fall out of this and I fall, then, 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 I'm going to need something to just kind of, cause I don't want to not serve you, but I, 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 I know how you are sometimes God, God isn't like that. God knows what he is when he comes to the table. He knows exactly what he, what he'll be when he comes to the table. But because of our own trauma and our own hurt and our own resistance and our own questioning of God and our own, like God didn't do God wasn't in our humanity's way to process the timing of God. I realized that I was having to, to be shed of all of these things that were standing in the way that were cushioning me. And now I was invested and I was like, oh my gosh, oh my gosh. If, if she wants to keep the baby, this is going to, this is just going to be a humdinger to get over. And, but I'm like, but I'm in, I'm in. And, um, she goes into labor and, I get called, you know, at 
an ungodly hour in the middle of the night. And um, the agency uh, gal is like, I've got to get a signature in a completely different city that's three hours away from a, a father releasing custody for another child. And she's like, so it's on you. You need to go. You need to go get her. You need to get her to the hospital. And I, so I'm in this. And I'm I'm driving and I'm picking her up and we're dropping her daughter off. And we're and it's just, you guys, so flippin' surreal. Like, what am I doing? This is the weirdest thing I'm in. I'm by myself and it's just me and the Lord and this woman. And we're getting her settled into the hospital. And I'm like, I can guarantee you I'm not the person she wanted to be with. And 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 she's the kindest, sweetest most precious, very quiet natured woman. But I'm like, I am not the person she wants to be with right now. And we're wheeled up there and I'm in the delivery room with her. Oh, I'm telling you, it's just, it's a, uh, woof. it's just a, when another woman is giving birth to your destiny, Oof, there's just so much about that. That's just like, whoa, this is like, this isn't, this is insane. Like the revelation of this is insane. And, and, and the beauty of what's happening is just like, like you're turn, I'm turning around. I'm like, nobody's witnessing this. Like I'm the only one witnessing this with the Lord. And I felt like the Lord was just like, remember every detail, like remember every detail, every detail, every part of the story, everything that you're feeling connects the dots it connects the dots to this journey it connects the dots of this journey and you know she's pushing this baby out and you know liberty say law is about to come out and out at the last minute comes this um discolored you know curly headed um uh a notice that the the umbilical cord was wrapped around um his little neck and the doctor was kind of looping that out and he was a little blue and and the doctor says, oh, it's a boy. <laughs> and the shock all around the room. And I see her face register, it's not a girl, it's a boy. And I am, I mean, my face must have just dropped. And out, you know, of, of her womb comes the seven pound little king. That's not what I thought it was. And the Lord turns the tables in that moment. And um, he just leans in really close and he just says, his name will be Justice Zane. And she had, I'd ask her for a, a name in her language to give him. And, um, and so on the way to the hospital that day, she says, I, I asked the Lord for a name. And, um, she named him um, Anesu, which means Emmanuel, God with us in her language. And I knew I wanted, um, you know, I, and I had an, a boy's name, but I, I was like, no, I'm not, you know. And so, so the Lord says, his name will be Justice. And he starts to quote this scripture in Isaiah, for it's in faithfulness I bring forth justice. And um, I knew I, I wanted a, a, a son one day that was named after my brother Zane. I loved my brother's name and I loved my brother's character. And so December 1st, 2004, God turns the tables and Justice Zane, Anesu Springer was born and nothing was the same after.